его к нам. Hi, Miyako. Is there any way that you can mute yourself when you're not presenting, just so that we don't hear any background noise? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me try. Yeah. Oh. Hi, I'm Yako. Uh, hi, everyone who's online. I'm sorry if you can uh, hear this. Just one second. We're doing some sound check. Miyako, um, if you could please um, uh, mute your phone um, if, or send me your phone number. Uh, via email, and that way I can communicate with you that way. Okay, thanks. And everyone, we will get started shortly.
All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Welcome to everyone here at Global Giving, and welcome to everyone online joining us from around the world. I am Jacqueline Lee, a Senior Program Associate here at Global Giving, and I work on our disaster response efforts. Um, today we are joined by Anne Sophie from Kids Save Inter or from sorry Accountability Lab, Christoph Kolhagen from Kids Save International, Yotam Pulizer from Isra Aid, and Andy Chagar from International Disaster Volunteers. Also, we have Miyako Hamasaka from Japan Emergency NGO. All right, so <laughs> so now um, I'm going to hand it off to Britt Lake. Um, our Senior Director of Programs here at Global Giving, who leads our disaster response program um, first to kick us off. Oh, also, I wanted to add that for everyone who's online, we have a team who will be monitoring hashtag GG uh, Disaster Panel 2016. Um, so you can input your questions or comments throughout the whole event. Um, and yeah, and they'll be monitoring and uh, answer any questions there. All right. So I'm going to hand it off to Britt Lake. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm really excited about this event. Um, I'm really lucky I get to talk to, to all of our disaster response um, and relief organizations all of the time. And they're doing such amazing work. And we're really excited about the opportunity to expose you all um, here in the room as well as uh, online to some of the amazing work that they're doing. Um, just to sort of set the context a little bit about Global Giving, Global Giving um, was founded in 2002. And initially, our focus really was e exclusively long-term development. So we were working um, exclusively with organizations that were focusing on the long term um, and actually limited the work that we were doing around um, anything related to humanitarian or disaster response. Then this happened in 2000, December 2004, um, a tsunami hit. You guys probably remember that. It was a, a major event, a uh, large loss of life. Um, and what we found were that a lot of our donors were writing to us and saying, you know, we're really, you know, we've already donated to the Red Cross or Save the Children or Care. And what we really want to do is supplement that giving with giving to local organizations that will be there in the long run, um, that really know the area well do you have any organizations you would recommend? At the same time, a lot of our local org organizations on the ground were coming to us and saying, you know, we're not a disaster relief organization, but our community was really affected by this disaster. Um, you know, we're not getting the funding. We're seeing a lot of funding coming in. We're hearing about all of these billions of dollars being donated on the news, but we're not seeing it. And we really need funding to um, help the communities that we're, that we're in. Um, and so we saw the gap there between what donors were wanting to give to and, and what our nonprofit partners on the ground were needed. Um, needed, And so we were able to sort of shift what we were doing at Global Giving to help support some of the organizations that we were working with that were responding on the ground to, to the tsunami. Um, why are we doing this now? Many of you may know next week is the World Humanitarian Summit. Um, for the first time ever, uh, the UN will be will be holding a worldwide summit focusing on these issues to really bring to light issues like um, financing the plight of humanitarian um, needs around the world, um, and wanted to really highlight um, the organizations that we're working with and the the local efforts that they're doing um, around this effort at this time. Um, just to put this in context, uh, every year the amount of organ uh, the amount of people who are affected by uh, humanitarian and disaster crises um, goes up. About 218 million people are affected uh, every year, uh, um, causing about two to three hundred billion dollars in damage. Um, again, this continues to go up um, as as conflict continues to arise in the world, inequality as well as climate change. Um, so unfortunately, these issues that we're talking about do not seem to be going down. Um, just a little bit about Global Giving's disaster response and our um, grant-making strategy and how it's a little bit different. Um, I want to highlight three things. Um, one is that it's locally driven. So we do um, we work both with local organizations as well as larger INGOs and feel that both of these groups do play an important role in the long-term uh, recovery of a location in crisis. Um, the organizations that we work with, we do look to have a local um, bond and a local presence in the place that they're working in. Um, generally, a lot of our immediate uh, 
response um, and funding uh, does go to organizations that are focused and are experts at the immediate relief efforts. And over the long term, it, it's focused more on local organizations that are based in that country, that have worked in that country both before and after the disaster. The second thing I want to highlight um, is that we believe local groups should drive local needs. So all of the organizations that we work with, we have had a relationship with before the disaster happens. So um, a disaster it's never the case that a disaster happens and some new organization writes to us and we fund them. These are all organizations that we have uh, trusted relationships with, that we've vetted, um, that most of the time we've visited on the ground and know the work that they're doing. Because of that, we know that um, we have this long-term relationship with the organizations and we can trust them to make the decisions that make the most sense where they are. So as much as possible, we try to have our grant making be focused on letting the organization drive the needs in their own communities rather than us dictating what they should be focusing on or what they should be funding. And then finally, um, long-term support. So we do look to have a relationship with all of our partners over the long run, not just in the immediate months after a disaster. Um, we do that in a number of ways. One is continuing um, to have these organizations on the Global Giving platform and expose uh, new donors to their organization in the long run, but also to do things like um, holding matching funding campaigns a year, one year, two years, or three years after a disaster, um, as well as continuing to provide in-kind support to those organizations that we work with. Um, so currently, Global Giving is um, responding in over a dozen uh, disasters around the world. You'll hear today about four of them. So you'll hear about um, the most recent Japan earthquake. You'll hear about um, the West Africa Ebola outbreak, the Nepal earthquake that happened last year, and the ongoing refugee crisis in Europe. I'm really, really excited for you guys to hear um, from the amazing five panelists that we have here. I've visited almost all of them um, in the field, and they're doing just really inspiring work. I'm also really excited for you to hear in um, the cr a new format, so they'll all be um, telling telling us their story um, in a creative format, which hopefully you'll like. Um, and so I want to pass it along um, first to Anne-Sophie, who's going to talk a little bit about Accountability Lab's experience. Thank you, Britt. Um, a year ago, a devastating earthquake hit Nepal, killing 9,000 people injuring tens of thousands of people and destroying half a million homes. Entire villages were flattened. Having worked in Nepal for three years, we immediately saw how a lack of transparency and citizen engagement could set back the relief process. Earthquake survivors did not know where to go to receive the, ne the relief that they desperately needed, and relief agencies did not know where to, to deliver their aid. So, the day after the earthquake, we partnered with local interventions group to set up the Mobile Citizen Help Desk. Our goal was to bridge the information gap between citizens, government stakeholders, and relief agencies. Because of our strong local networks on the ground, we were able to mobilize 100 young, enthusiastic volunteers to serve as help desk volunteers. Because they were members of the community themselves, they were able to um, quickly connect with people on the ground and accurately assess their needs. They began by going to um, places where um, displaced earthquake victims were heavily congregated and listening to their struggles and talking to them about their needs. For example, in the hospital they met a woman named Tuli who had lost all contact with her relatives, and they contacted a local radio station that was able to reunite her with her family. They also helped people to um, figure out how to navigate the government aid system. They helped them fill out relief forms and also um, build communication channels with their local government officials. Um, we, excuse me, um, and these one-on-one -on -one interactions, um, as well as data we received through an SMS um, help desk, um, was able to identify all sorts of needs that help um, earthquake victims had. Um, we found that um, 
we found that these um, that the relief was often distributed unfairly on a first come first served basis, and that women, children, and rural communities were marginalized. Um, many people did not know how to get information about government um, decisions, and um, so a lot of our time was spent matching communities with these um, aid providers that could best as assess their needs. Um, and after, after doing that, we realized that we needed to reevaluate wh what we were doing. And as the situation evolved, we set up a um, community perception survey where we um, worked in the 14 hardest hit districts. And we selected local journalists to serve as district coordinators because they already knew very well how to um, collect and disseminate information. And they began um, going house to house and administering the survey. And we received a donation from the UN for 100 smartphones. But as many challenges occur in disaster relief, um, they were all stuck in customs for months. So we did it by paper until, until the phones arrived. And um, we were able to survey um, 1,400 um, citizens each month. And this was compiled into reports, which um, showed our findings and were sent to um, 50 different humanitarian agencies and government agencies, including the ones here, um, who used it to guide their strategies. But we also found that there were a lot of rumors going around in the communities. For example, there were um, people heard that certain color ID cards were um, invalid, but really they had just ran out of that color of paper. And we, they also heard that there was definitely going to be another earthquake on September 17th. But we know that um, that can't be predicted. So we set up the open mic reports. And as you can see here, they include um, fact-checked information on the issues that people identified, as well as um, contact information for the relevant official that they can get even more information to address their needs. And we've seen a lot of impact so far um, from this. For example, um, we were able to get kids like these to um, get out of unsafe, cracked buildings um, for schools. We were able to um, help farmers to um, find places where they could store their crops during the rainy season. And we were even able to track the government um, funds, where the government funds were going. But um, Collecting the information isn't enough. We realized that we need to um, share it back with the communities to develop feedback loops. And so we, we did this through radio programs, and we also held community um, meetings. And so far, we've been able to reach 795 um, communities to solve over 500 problems directly for earthquake victims and to give information on the relief effort to 60,000 people. However, the relief effort is not over. 80% um, of citizens say that their reconstruction needs are not being met. Um, the government plans to give citizens money to rebuild their homes, but there are a lot of bureaucratic hurdles, including they want to set up a bank account for every citizen. And so we hope that our model of citizen engagement can help make that process more efficient and um, continue to give citizens a voice in the process. Um, we, um, we believe that citizen voice is important. Accountability can only happen when there are feedback loops. We hope that this model of citizen engagement can, can be used in other disaster um, situations that arise beyond Nepal and in international development more broadly. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anne Sophie. Next, we have um, Christoph from Kids Save, who's going to talk about some work that they have done in Sierra Leone. Yes. December 2013, Ebola was first seen in Guinea. By 2014, it was in Liberia and Sierra Leone. And Kids Save, we are working in Sierra Leone. A lot of medical professionals believe there could be a pandemic across the world, killing millions. It was in New York. Ebola was in Texas. Anyone here remember being a bit nervous about Ebola? Well, people were dying, and they were dying in horrible ways. And children often losing their families would end up back in their homes alone, blood-spattered walls, 
their goods taken out, their possessions burned to stop further infection. Nobody was prepared for the mass influx of orphans that was to come. The government of Sierra Leone registered uh, 8,600 orphans, whereas Street Child UK believed there were over 12,000 within the country. The government was stretched beyond capacity. They built interim care centers to take in these children, and these are now becoming permanent. At Kids Save, we had been working in Sierra Leone for the last five years running our family visit model, where we train local communities and adults and families to take in orphans, uh, take in children out of institutions for short-term visits, and to advocate for them in their communities. Oftentimes, they'll find them permanent families or become permanent families for them themselves. When Ebola hit, again, no one was ready. We had antiquated computers there, of course, poor internet connections. And so you'll see an example of our partner organization's attempt to organize this chaos as children came out every day needing help and trying to track and keep an eye on them. And clearly, we needed a better system. This is an Ebola checkpoint during the time. It was hard to get through cities. You had to watch, wash with chlorine, get your temperature taken. And whole cities and communities we worked in were quarantined, which means you couldn't get in or out. And hard uh, information, hard copies, always had a chance of being burned. You couldn't get out of the city. So that's when Global Giving reached out to us and helped connect us with Journey Apps, a South African uh, technology company that helped to build us an app to help track and help these children. You can see our database, the back screen there, uh, showing some of the different interim care centers and orphanages that are working with us to help get these children permanent families. This is Sadatu, uh, one of our social workers in our program. She's entering the information into the app of a young boy who lost his family to Ebola in the village of Sembahun. This helps data hygiene as well, because only Sadatu enters it as a first person. When she enters a Wi-Fi enabled area, it automatically uploads into our database. Another strong aspect of this uh, app is that it actually marks where the person enters this information through GPS. So we can go back and find originally where these children were, but especially find where these unknown and unregistered orphanages are and institutions that have these children. Now, the law in Sierra Leone is that all orphanages must register with the Ministry of Social Welfare, but there's not the capacity for it. It's just not a reality. And so this is actually an unregistered orphanage in Sierra Leone. So how many children are living outside of family care in Sierra Leone? Nobody knows. Nobody's counting. And how many kids lost their families to Ebola? Nobody knows. Now this is Haiti, 2010, after the earthquake that killed over 200,000 people. And similarly to Sierra Leone, no one knows where a lot of the orphanages were, where large populations of the children are. And still, nobody's counting a lot of this throughout the world. And so what we need is a better system, really, to count these children and to find them. Because children not counted, children not identified, can't be helped. And they can end up languishing in institutions for an unknown amount of time and having massive psychological repercussions. And this is what's so excited about the app that we had the help of Global Giving and Journey Apps to build, is that now we're able to track and help many of these children. But we're still looking for help because we want to incorporate even better things into the app like biometrics. So you know, we're reaching out looking for that so we can do fingerprinting and follow these children and know more about them. And so how does that tie into these kind of goals of development, these broad goals we have? Well, of course, the sustainable development goals from the UN, the very first goal is to end poverty. And the first measure of that goal is to implement socially appropriate, or, sorry, nationally appropriate social protection systems and measures. And if we want to do that, if we want the measures, we have to actually count these children. We have to know where they are if we want to build these, you know, these systems to actually find and help them. And so this is where Kids Save works. These are the countries we're in now, uh, tracking orphans, tra uh, uh, tracking children outside of family care, and trying to protect them and help them get into permanent families. Now, the world's attention has moved on from Sierra Leone, uh, but Kids Save's attention has not. And our most recent project there is in Pujahun, uh, where we've recently identified 240 Ebola orphans living in an interim care center. We have the current budget to actually target 65 of them uh, for permanent family care within their community, and that's what we're doing. Now, we've had success in our projects, of course, and you'll see in the yellow is Bintu and her cousin Omar. They lost their family to Ebola. Uh, they were quarantined within their hut, and eventually when they were uh, 
evacuated out to Bo, they met Elizabeth, a local trader at a Kids Save event, who took them in, and now they're a family. This is Chief Christopher. His hands are as strong as the rocks he breaks for a living into gravel. Uh, he's actually a chief in the Kenema area. He vets families for us. And he met three Ebola orphans at a Kids Save event and would later take them into his family. They call him Dad. And they, he said, without our program, something terrible would have happened to these children, and most likely they wouldn't have survived. Now, we are currently tracking and helping, trying to help, hundreds of Ebola orphans in Sierra Leone. We've put some, a decent amount actually, over 100, into permanent family care, but there are so many kids still out there that are being forgotten. We don't know where they are. And so we're really looking to count these children. And these are our choices. right? We can either push forward and count these children, build uh, you know, plans for what happens when the next disaster that's coming happens. right? And we can put them into families, as you can see here, or we can do nothing. But we want to thank Global Giving, and we want to thank Journey Apps, and thank all the donors and all of you who do such good work. Thank you. Um, next, we have Yotam from Israel, who came literally straight from the airport from Japan to be here. So if he falls asleep while he's talking, <laughs> cut him some slack. But here's Yotam. So great to be here. Um, I'm, we're actually working in Japan, in the Ebola, in Nepal, in different crises with Global Giving, one of our main and most important partners. But I want to talk today about the refugee crisis. So this picture that um, you see behind me is taken from the island of Lesbos, where here, Good. okay, where um, Malek, one of our nurses, uh, was standing, and that's me when I when I first got there last um, last September. You know, all these pictures, these crazy images that we see on the news, they are real. Seven thousand, seven to ten thousand people are arriving every day in Lesbos. Almost 60% of them are women and children from Syria and Iraq. For us, it was a whole new experience. What we knew before about disaster was that. That picture was taken by me in Japan four days after the tsunami in 2011. Um, we knew how to deal with natural disasters. We knew how to deal with um, epidemics like the Ebola. Um, but we never prepared ourselves for an ongoing disaster like the refugee crisis. This is a picture from Sierra Leone where we worked um, in the Ebola Treatment Center helping um, the burial teams. So again, the refugee crisis is something that non, no organization that we know, and of course not us, could have prepared to. And, and unlike other disasters, um, it was an ongoing disaster. This picture is actually from Nepal. And, um, and it was taken um, by our rescue team that was able to find the last survivor of the earthquake 130 hours after the earthquake. So I remember when I first got to Lesbos, I actually came from Nepal um, to the refugee crisis. And, um, and, and, and this is how it started for us, you know. It started in Jordan. It started by, let's say, a typical emergency relief response with providing food and medicine. Um, and then we moved from Jordan to Iraq um, because it spread it. You know, ISIS came. Um, so we started working in Iraq um, in the refugee camps. Um, in Kurdistan area, area, again, providing food, water, medicine, still a typical emergency relief. But then um, the, the crisis um, from Syria and Iraq expanded, expanded to other areas um, like, uh, like Greece. And, and this, this picture is actually from Serbia, where we started um, a Facebook group called Slings for Refugees, where mothers from all over the world were donating baby slings um, to the refugees. OK, now I can see myself. Great. Um, so we stretch. We stretch ourselves. Um, one of the most amazing story was that um, our medical team received a phone call from volunteers who were on the beach telling us that a pregnant Syrian lady, nine months pregnant, um, her water just broke literally when she got on the beach. Um, they went there. They deliver the baby, and thank God the baby is healthy. And these pictures were sent to our medical team on WhatsApp um, when the mother um, arrived to Germany. So um, you can see the baby um, on one side, and then the baby with his brother um, on the right side. 
Um, and so far, Israel helped deliver six babies, and all of them are healthy. All of them are with their families in other parts of Europe. And you know, we're talking. We're we're an Israeli-based organization. We have both Palestinian and Israeli um, team members. Uh, and for us, being able to help Muslim refugees, mostly from Syria and Iraq, and help them deliver the babies, it's a very very significant thing. Um, but you know, the crisis is not only emergency. It's also there's also a need for long-term support, and this is our teams providing education um, and STEM education, science and technology education in refugee camps um, in Jordan. But what we're really focusing on, and really what we're seeing now as the main need, is the psychological support. This um, is um, a counseling, individual counseling session for Yazidi refugees in Iraq. Um, I'm sure you all heard about the Yazidi. They were um, the team that was suffered from the worst atrocities by ISIS. And this is actually an art therapy session. I don't know if you can see the image as well, but it was painted by a 15 years old Muhammad from Syria. And he drew um, his family uh, that was beheaded by ISIS. Him and his uncle, who were the only survivors, escaped to another city. And that's where the Assad regime was throwing rockets on them. So it helped me really understand the depth and the complexity of the trauma that these children are facing. But what we've also seen in this um, terrible refugee crisis is that it's also an opportunity to build bridges. And this is why that one of our social worker hugging a Syrian lady where we actually helped the Syrians um, celebrate um, the most important Muslim festival. we also seen the Greek prime minister um, coming and visiting our program and actually asked us for, for support and for advice in how to deal with the influx of, ref of, of refugees. So it was a great opportunity for us to build strong relationship with the government. It was also, <coughs> it was also another um, visitor that we had was Susan Sarandon, um, who came over Christmas after she had the wonderful um, declaration from some uh, political leaders in the States about not accepting Muslims. Um, she wanted to show um, that she cares, and she came and spent two weeks with us in Lesbos. So again, another opportunity to raise awareness um, and to build bridges. And this picture is actually from Germany. In Germany, we have a really interesting program because, you know, um, I'm actually a grandson of Holocaust survivors. The Jewish community, the German government, a lot of uh, German volunteers have joined hands with us to help um, the refugees in shelters in Berlin, Munich, and Frankfurt. And this person here with our social worker is actually, his name is Gerard Bader. He's 91 years old, Holocaust survivor. When he um, saw you know, the refugees coming in Fausen, he decided he wanted to do something. And, and we said, Gerard, what can you do? He um, said, no, I want to come. I want to come to the refugee shelter. And actually, this guy, this inspiring person, takes two trains every week. It takes him one hour from one side to Berlin to the other, and coming with our team to the refugee shelters. And he's teaching German. Um, to Syrian and Iraqi refugees, um, and and we're so inspired and humbled. And again, how these terrible disasters could also be opportunities. Thank you. Thanks. And now we are going into the internet. Um, to welcome Andy from International Disaster Volunteers, who has a really ex interesting uh, life story that he's going to tell you. I won't, I won't spoil it for you, but take it away, Andy. Hi, everyone. I wasn't sure if I'd just be on audio today, so I wanted to start with my photo so that you could put a face to the voice coming out of the speakers. And I also want to tell you a little bit about my own personal story of disaster, because this sets the scene for our charity's current work in Nepal. And I'm going to sum up my story today in three hashtags. Firstly, I am a survivor of the 2004 tsunami in Thailand. I was about 30 meters from the beach when the first wave hit, and I was very lucky to make it out alive. From this experience, I gained an empathy with and a desire to help other survivors. Secondly, I am a volunteer. Once able, I went back to Thailand and I lent my skills as an engineer and also my own two hands to the rebuilding process. This experience changed my life as much as the tsunami itself had. During this time, I saw that volunteers could help survivors in many ways. Finally, I am a CEO. 
Both of the previous experiences led me to set up IDV and they directly feed into our work in Nepal today. Most importantly, we always put survivors first, but to help support them, we also provide the framework for all types of volunteers to get involved along the way. But to be clear, in other words, our mission is to help survivors by providing relief and helping them achieve long-term recovery. But our method is to directly connect survivors to both volunteers and also to a global network of volunteers who also want to help with their own two hands. Now, to be clear, IDV is not a voluntourism organization. I would define those as valuing a volunteer experience above the needs of survivors, which is the opposite of what we do. However, we do believe in volunteerism, and I'll use the case of Nepal to explain more about how we work. So just over a year ago, Nepal was hit by two earthquakes, which had a huge impact. Around 9,000 people were killed and over 20,000 more injured. Over half a million homes and 35,000 classrooms were also destroyed, and hundreds of thousands of people also lost their food supply. In response, and with Global Giving's help, we began providing immediate relief, starting with a small team of our most experienced volunteers. And while we're now welcoming all different types of volunteers in Nepal, we only started doing this after our early response team laid the groundwork. In fact, we kept our Nepal team small and mobile for the first five months. This allowed us to respond quickly in six of the affected districts. We provided 6.4 tons of food aid and immediate shelter to almost 400 families. We also provided water, sanitation and hygiene for over 1,100 people. We also provided 30 transitional classrooms to get almost 1,000 kids back in class and school furniture and supplies so that they had somewhere to sit and something to ride with. By October, we'd supported over 5,500 survivors. But while statistics are great in some ways, they're also pretty anonymous. So I want to talk about a face behind those figures and about how our longer-term work has helped seven-year-old Rishan. The earthquake destroyed Rishan's home and badly damaged his school. So last year, we repaired four classrooms for Rashad and his classmates. And here are some photos from before our work. On the left, you can see how many classroom walls had collapsed during the earthquake. And on the right, you can see the temporary classroom that Rashad and his classmates were using as a result. And this is very similar to the type of classroom that many of the affected kids are still using today, almost a year, over a year later. And here are some shots from during and after our work. Now this project started about six months after the earthquake. And so by this point, we were able to use all types of volunteers and not just those with specific skills like engineers. And importantly, we also got the teachers and the kids involved in the painting of the new classrooms. And of course, Rashan was in the thick of it. Now I love this photo because I think Rashan's face says it all. He had a great time painting and he also now has a little bit of ownership over his new classroom. And I'm willing to bet that neither Rashan or any of the volunteers involved will ever forget the day this photo was taken. And this, in a nutshell, is IDV at its best. Our projects directly connect survivors like Rashan with our own volunteers. Our volunteers work hand in hand with survivors in Nepal, and they often then go on to become advocates and fundraisers for us when they return home. Our volunteers talk to their networks about our projects and also their own part in them. And this creates more personal connections that lead to more donations and fundraising. This helps us to run the next project and the cycle continues. And we think this is one way that our volunteers can really help Nepal in the long term. Despite a year having passed since the earthquakes, long-term reconstruction has barely even started in many ways. Rebuilding has been delayed by the monsoon season, which often cuts off rural communities, and then by a four-month fuel crisis, which made transporting materials pretty expensive. And so the challenge that survivors now face is simply the long haul. Global Giving's own data for Nepal shows how support is fading over time, and the country also effectively lost eight months' reconstruction due to the problems mentioned. So it's vital we try and keep the situation in people's minds moving forward.
And one of, the, one of the ways we're doing this is by continuing to connect survivors with volunteers and donors. For example, our volunteers recently worked to build school bathrooms, and we've also just started work on five more permanent classrooms. And in both cases, many of the volunteers involved have already mobilized their networks to donate during Global Giving's current 100% matching campaign. So my final point is just to say a big thank you both to Global Giving and all the donors who've helped Nepal. While our volunteers are increasing their own fundraising efforts, grants from Global Giving have been critical to our work, particularly early on, and the ongoing match funding opportunities are also helping to sustain momentum. So thank you all very much. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, and last from the internet, uh, we'll be joined by Miyako from Japan Emergency NGO. I know it's very late slash early in Japan, um, so we're really grateful for her to join us. Any second. Great. And really quick, while um, we're setting up Miyako, um, I hope you're enjoying this uh, unique visual storytelling format. Um, it's inspired by, I don't know if you've heard of Pecha Kucha, but basically uh, each presenter has 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide to tell a story. Um, you know, not just standing up here and having a PowerPoint with a lot of words, but really getting to the point in a succinct amount of time. Um, so I hope you're all uh, enjoying this. Um, are we ready to go with Miyako? No. Okay. All right, um, so in the meantime, um, I was thinking maybe we could have a question from if anyone has any questions so far. <laughs> nope. Um, I think we had one. Oh, yeah, Blair. I have a question. Yeah, uh, here. Oh, oh, thanks. Hello, I'm Blair with the Accountability Lab. Um, my question is for Kids Save, because we also work in Liberia and did some work around the Ebola stuff. What were the biggest challenges you faced sort of in the immediate period when you arrived? How did you? Um, kind of move beyond those challenges and what lessons are there for other organizations working in the region? All right. <clears throat> well, that is a fabulous question, of course. Uh, the challenge is really, well, uh, one I was trying to get was reporting, uh, really staying in touch in terms of internet issues, which <clears throat> I know Liberia has at least as poor uh, internet as Sierra Leone. So. One was just staying in touch with each other. Uh, I'd say that was a big one for us. Um, and so really, I mean, following up with the kids, seeing what was going on. Again, I mean, we would hear about areas about to get quarantined, and we would have to try to get a team out as quick as we could to get families out of there, kids save families. Um, so another problem was transportation. So one of the things that Global Giving helped us to do was to provide a vehicle for our team. Uh, because, of course, public transport at that time, if you remember, I mean, you got a taxi cab and you didn't put on a seatbelt because it was a, you didn't know who put on the seatbelt before you. So it's these kinds of things. So I would say mobility, uh, the ability to transfer information would be the two that really jumped my head. Uh, and, I mean, yeah, basically getting around, meeting who you had to meet, getting, I mean, if you remember, too, trying to get in to speak at any meeting, you, again, would get your temperature taken, go in, and people were afraid. I'd say there was fear as well. Um, but I can also throw it out to our director. Well, we only have a few stigma. Right. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good point. Do we have... <clears throat> Sorry. That's a great point, uh, Terry, but our director pointed out the stigma. I mean, you know, the fear of these children was a big issue as well because, you know, we're still finding out if, if a bowl is still within people's eyes or things. And so, of course, that's a really great point. I mean, just trying to place these children and trying to get beyond the stigma of these children possibly bringing this disease into the family. Great point. Um, so I think we're not able to connect, so let's just move into the Q&A. Let's be flexible. Yeah. Um, if you guys want to pull up your chairs, we can continue with the questions. Thanks for kicking us off. Um, as everyone else pulls up their chairs, I just want to acknowledge we sort of did already. We have a few other people in the room that can bring some great um, insight. So we have um, Blair and An Anush Anusha from Accountability Lab, um, who are also here, and then Terry and Prayer from KidSave. 
Um, so feel free to ask them questions as well. I'll, you know, I'll just I'll stand over here. Um, great. So to kick us off, um, I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, just to start off, what advice would you guys have for any major donor looking to fund um, a post-disaster effort? Who wants to answer first? Um, I think for for us um, working um, in 19 countries and trying to respond to basically every disaster, um, there is a point that we call it the um, aid festival or the aid circus. And and everyone <coughs> who works around disaster, I think, know this term um, in one word or the other. And and it's usually the first 30 to 90 days where the whole media attention is there, the whole world is in the disaster. Um, and, and most of the funding comes in. I, I heard numbers between 85 to 95 percent. Um, and I think uh, my colleagues here will probably agree. Um, we see it in Nepal, we see it in Sierra Leone now when the world um, is kind of turning its back. Um, so I think for donors, um, look for long-term impact. Don't waste all the funds at the very first stage. The needs are sometimes much greater after and in a way, when everyone leaves, um, we see it's, it's kind of re-traumatizing the local population. Not only they went for a terrible disaster, but also they're being abandoned by the whole world after being the center of attention. That's my first thing. Great. Thanks. I would add on top of that, because I think that's a really great point, uh, but also for those big donors to fund where their passions are as well, because that's what they'll be interested in seeing through to the end. And you know where their passions lie is where they're really going to want to follow up and to want to continue and find out where it's going and to see what's necessary next. I think that's a really great point you made. I mean, you can throw money at it, but if your passion isn't there, you're not going to come back and see it through. Um, I think I can tap into um, some experience we had while we were there when we um, in Nepal, and um, we saw um, when we went to villages, we saw that. Um, there were organizations distributing rice when, but when we talked to the citizens, they said that we actually have plenty of rice, and our our biggest concern is that our our cattle don't have any shelter, and the monsoon season is coming. Um, so I think really understanding um, citizens' needs is critical, um, and and along with that, not rushing in. Um, we also saw um, South Korean donors who were um, had brought all this equipment and. Um, were kind of just wandering around and didn't know where to bring in, didn't have a plan. And so I think it's it's very important while while immediate need while need, there are great needs in the beginning, it's important to really understand what you're doing. And I think that a great way to do that is by um, partnering with local organizations. So it really takes a combination of um, international donors and local um, donors working together to um, be effective. Great. Um, Andy, do you want to add anything? I mean, just to, to echo I suppose, the sentiments that have been said, I mean, it's, it's going back to what Yotan was saying, it's obviously the immediate aftermath is very emotive, um, you know, there's, a, there's an immediate outpouring, but the needs are going to be there for years afterwards, and it's, you know, it's about thinking about recovery as well as immediate relief, because both things are equally important. Great, thanks. I want to open it up for the audience. Does anyone have a question for our panelists? Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Ermal from uh, the World Bank. I had a question for Israel. How do you see the future of the Syrian uh, refugee crisis given the increasing political pushback, this country included? Well, the, the easy answer is that luckily we don't need to provide answers. Um, it's, it's a very difficult question. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've been following the news, but the numbers all of a sudden dropped, so a lot less people are coming to Greece. That's from two reasons. One, there is an EU-Turkey agreement, and the other reason is that the border is technically moving to Western Europe from um, Greece to Macedonia are closed, basically. There's no way to pass through, only for a very dangerous um, river. So it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to see. On the other hand, we know that the war in Syria and Iraq is not coming to an, an, an end soon. Um, we, we do estimate that more people will come, people will look for new routes, uh, whether it's through Italy, through other, other islands. 
Um, I know that at least from our team in Greece, um, the situation is a little bit more stable in the sense that um, the people who are there now, the, the, the refugees from Syria who are there now, they can apply for re different relocations program for the UN. It took a long time because of this influx, because of the numbers that was just overwhelming, um, took a long time for, for the UN, for the government, for us as an NGO to, to build a system. The system is there now, it's better, um, but again, it could, be, it could be improved. I think, you know, for us, what we're seeing now for the people who already arrived um, as the main need um, is, is the psychological part, is the psychological trauma. Um, so for us, at least, this is the, the main focus that I think um, the UN, the government, is not yet focusing on us. Great, thanks. Um, next, I want to see if there are any questions online that have come in. Tia. Yeah, so one question is just, what do you find your biggest challenge to be when responding to a disaster? Well, yeah. I'll start. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, okay. No, I, there are so many challenges, but I I think um, the uh, cultural um, context is the most important um, and difficult thing to understand. Every place is so different. We just responded to the earthquake in Ecuador um, without Spanish-speaking staff. There is no point of even going. Same goes to the Syrian crisis where we have Arabic-speaking staff in Nepal. We have Nepalese in Japan. So the, the local culture and language um, and understanding is the most important. And the second thing is that really, and I think you mentioned that um, without local partners, our work as an international organization is really worthless. We need local partners, and we need multiple local partners, um, both on the non-governmental and, and governmental sectors, and identifying good partners um, is a big challenge. I would say for kids save it was really learning as we went along because we don't always work in disasters. I mean our, our main mission is to find families for children outside of family care so we aren't going into disasters. We were already on the ground in Sierra Leone so really just trying to learn from people like you and from from whoever we could and to try to make the right decisions and to try to help out the children and families that we worked with. That was really our challenge, was being involved in a disaster, I think. I would definitely echo that, too. Um, and I think because we are not a, a traditional relief agent, um, organization, we, are, we found ourselves in a disaster and saw a need that we could, um, that we could address, but um, we did so in a non-traditional way that it took a lot of... Um, I think time and, and effort to help people understand what we were doing and um, and kind of the purpose of it because often sometimes we would go to communities and they would expect us to bring supplies when when we were there to um, create more systemic change that they might not immediately see that we are there to gather their feedback to send to dozens of um, relief agencies that, that can then um, address their needs at a much broader scale but I think just um, that initial kind of sensitization to what we're doing and also um, getting buy-in from relief agencies to to use our data and to to take a chance to listen to what we have to say and and um, and we made progress on this but, but yeah definitely a challenge. Andy, wrap us up. Hi, can you hear me? Do you want to respond to that or should we move on? Yeah, I mean, echoing the, the other things, I mean, the, the context is always, um, you know, it's very different in each place, but I think one thing, particularly in the early days, is often often the challenge of information, uh, particularly in the immediate aftermath and the, the situation's so changing so quickly and more information's coming in, and it's, you know, just trying to kind of collate all that and analyze it and organize it is, is, is often very difficult.
lot of disaster response from 2004 to now. You've, I know, worked in, um, in the 2004 tsunami in Haiti, um, in the Philippines, um, in Nepal. So I'd love to hear if you have seen any trends over time um, in terms of humanitarian response. And Yotam, I know you've been involved in this field for a while, too, so you might have some um, things to add after Andy as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one good thing uh, which I'm seeing more recently, um, perhaps more starting so in Tacloban after Haiyan and again in Nepal, was um, it goes back to that information thing, but trying to push information down to communities um, as well as just taking the information back up and you know simply letting people know when help's coming, where it's coming, what they need to do to access that information. It's it's, it's seeming to become more of a two-way exchange of information rather than just just a one-directional thing. And I think that's a that's a very good thing. Improvements still need to be made, but it seems like that you know that is one trend that's 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 picking up momentum and hopefully will continue. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Andy. I, just adding to that, I think the two major mega disasters um, that was in the last um, 12 years, so the 2004, obviously, tsunami, and then Haiti in 2010, which I think was a very uh, important milestone in humanitarian response in how to do things, but mostly in how not to do things. Um, so I'm sure you all heard about that, a lot of criticism that was towards the humanitarian response in Haiti. Um, and um, and, and I think a lot of organization, a lot of agencies um, from the biggest, um, like the World Bank or Red Cross or others, and, and smaller organization like us, um, realize that there's much more need for coordination, for information, for working with local partners, for not just pouring money in. Um, a very interesting trend that I see now in the refugee crisis is the use of technology. Um, there's so much. Um, that's going on now with technology, um, whether it's with social media, different apps, Google Maps. We, we used to get um, the coordinates of, of, of the Google Map from refugees while they're on the boat. So our team was able to wait in the right place and to also direct them. We also had a drone that originally we used for actually um, for taking pictures of the boat, but it actually the refugees ended up following this drone to a safe haven. So really interesting things that happen by chance. Um, I think the understanding in humanitarian response that there, is, there isn't a manual. You, you can't plan the Ebola outbreak because you, know, you don't know it will happen. It will be so massive. You can't plan the refugee crisis. So understanding that we don't understand anything um, is a very important realization, I think, um, that, that you know, we're feeling now. Great. Um, both of you guys sort of mentioned information, and Andy in particular talked about the flow of information. So I'd love to hear um, from Accountability Lab and Sophia and Blair if you want to add anything. Um, what advice do you have for NGOs or organizations that are working in disaster response, um, sort of tips and tricks for good um, information collection and exchange? Sure, I'll start, and um, I'm sure Blair will have some good ideas um, to chime in with. Um, but I think one, one major thing is that's helped us be really successful is um, working with local journalists on the ground. And in the 14, each of the 14 districts, we found um, journalists to serve as district coordinators. And they were already um, had um, really broad networks with the government officials, with citizens, um, and other actors, relevant actors. And so that allowed us to have easy channels to disseminate and, and collect information. Um, and Blair, do you have any others? Um, I think it's also about being being flexible uh, and adaptive and iterating very quickly in, in response to challenges, um, which I think we, we did relatively well. We were having community meetings to, to give information back to people, um, realized those needed to be supplemented with radio uh, outreach as well, for example. Um, and then I think a, a broader point which relates to to the, the point that was just brought up about this being disaster response and we're talking about what happens afterwards. Um, a lot of it is about being prepared beforehand and, and all of our organizations I think were working in the countries where these things happened beforehand um, and so have the networks to, to leverage to, to respond quickly and flexibly um, because I don't think all disasters are unpredictable. In Nepal there are landslides every year, in Pakistan there's earthquakes and floods pretty much every year. Um, so what we're trying to do now is codify what we've done into a disaster account accountability toolkit 
to help engage communities ahead of time in the areas where these things are likely to happen to make sure that we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time and that the communication channels are in place and the people are engaged in the right kind of ways to make sure that the response is effective and, and quick. Great, thanks. Um, now I want to see if anyone else in the room has another question. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Reland. I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm originally from Kosovo, so uh, I, I see that most of you do disaster re relief work, and I it was mentioned briefly about the that transition period. So my question is, what can organizations like yours uh, focus on to facilitate that transition period from disaster or emergency response to and then on longer term or medium term development because I, I've seen a first as a first hand experience as when I was a kid in Kosovo there were a lot of organizations in the first first year or two and then all of a sudden the country is left to pretty much survive on its own of course there's still some aid but there's still not that attention so what can these organizations at the beginning maybe tackle early on that would help with the development on the long on the long run. Um, that's a great question, and I think that um, kind of going on what we going off of what we said um, earlier about working with local organizations, I think that can can really help because then you are not only investing um, kind of in the initial recovery, but you are helping as you work with local organizations and as they. Um, work on the relief process, they're building relationships with the government and with um, all the different actors that make that long-term relief possible. Um, so I think that really is a sustainability factor um, to it. And then I think also um, just being very um, continually reevaluating what you're doing and um, listening to citizens' needs. And I think you'll learn from them kind of when the transition is happening and um, and they often know best kind of what's what's needed and um, so th that voice is, can really help. I think that's, <clears throat> pardon me, a really a good point about the sustainability and I think there's also a point to leveraging increased assets to a point but maybe not overreaching with them. So one of the things that we needed were more social workers <clears throat> to be able to check on the, on the kids out there that were going to the families to check on the families but at a certain point, we didn't want to stretch so far that when that inevitable fallback of funding happened, that we kind of left these people on the lurch and left these kids out there. So I think there's that idea of sustainability, the idea of you know training um, the groups, the local groups we're working with in our model so that they can train other people in our model and it can go out there, but also you know not trying to grow so big so quickly during the disaster that then all of a sudden it just pulls back. I think what you were uh, getting at as well. Yeah, no, um, again, just echoing, um, you know, the, the metaphor that we always use for that is um, we don't want to give people fish, we want to teach them how to fish, or even one step further, we want to teach them how they could build their fish ponds or their fishing nets. Um, and, and there's a lot of methods um, that's used in the development humanitarian world, it's called TOT, training of trainers, um, you are just mentioning. Um, F to to tackle exactly that, but to be honest, I think it's still it's still very challenging. Um, we are all all the organization, all the nonprofits are struggling for funding after that, um, and 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 I think the key to all of that is to try not to spend all the funding in the very first stage, to stretch it a little bit. That's what we're trying to do at least to um, to find good local partners to not only train but to also supervise and monitor so to invest a lot of um, resources in in providing follow-ups um, after initial trainings or after um, initial delivery of, of knowledge um, it's, it's a big big challenge hello yep did you want to add anything yeah, so, sorry, I'm coming in out a little bit on the audio. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, actually, because I'm, I'm personally, I've always been a very big believer in the idea of, of more developmental relief, so that you're not trying to separate relief and recovery as such, but trying to build things in for the more developmental thinking in from the start, and there's lots of technical ways to go about that, but I think the simplest thing to remember is, 
is or try and always remember is that survivors themselves aren't helpless. Um, and this goes back to my own experience after the tsunami. I, I needed help and I needed support, but it was also very important to me that I was in charge of my own recovery and I was able to set the direction. Um, and I think it's you know just important going on from that, just to try and give survivors back as much ownership over their lives and the recovery process as, as soon as possible, basically. Questions online, Tia. Yeah, so we have a question. It's, what do you see nonprofits doing on the ground over and over again that just doesn't work? Or what lessons has your organization learned from past efforts that didn't pay off? So it doesn't work. I'll start. <laughs> um, OK. Um, a lot of things doesn't work. I, I think um, maybe the, the example that you gave um, from Nepal um, about um, organization that are coming um, just with massive resources in the very beginning and, and not coordinating with other organizations. I've seen organization give cash to people in the Philippines, um, $400 um, per person is a huge amount of money for the local population in the Philippines. And, and I spoke to them and I asked, what, why do you give cash? Um, uh, and they said, we want to cut all the middlemen. We know that a lot of organizations are charging, so we want to give directly to the people. So in a way, it, it made sense, but, um, but it was very difficult and very problematic because there was no monitoring system, because people were just looking to spend money, take pictures, go home. And, and then it created also a lot of expectations. Um, from a local community. So when we came and we said we want to give you psychosocial support, they said we want cash. So <laughs> why are you coming us with psychological support? So so giving money directly to people, doing things in a non-monitored um, way, not coordinated way with other organizations, um, is a typical uh, it's a typical challenge that we're we're facing with a lot of organizations that are coming. I think that's a good answer. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't really have a specific answer for what the other NGOs are, are doing wrong. I mean, I think we all make mistakes and we have to learn from them. Um, but I don't necessarily know of one in particular that I see again and again and again. I mean, I could probably point out lots of different mistakes people have made, but especially in disasters, they're probably not always new, but, you know, it depends on, on, on the disaster. I agree. Um, I guess one little thing to add is that um, it doesn't work not not to take the context in into account. It doesn't work to um, use the same um, process that you use in one country and another country without really thinking about um, what's going on there and um, talking to different actors um, across the board to see kind of what their needs are, what they already have. Um, and um, kind of how things are changing every day. Um, anything to add, Blair? Or, or, or you? I have something to add, but you can go first. Go, go ahead. Um, well, the one other thing to add that goes back to the last question, too, about sustainability and how you transition from sort of relief to response is it has to be collaborative with the government, I think. You know, there are always tons of problems with governments in generally in, in these kinds of situations, and Nepal was a very good example. Um, but we worked hard to build the relationship with the key actors within government, because otherwise we all go home and, and uh, the programs aren't sustainable, the capacity hasn't, hasn't been developed in a way that can deal with some of the problems. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece, the other gripe that I have a little bit with development generally is there isn't any barrier to entry at all. You know, you can, you can turn up in one of these places because you want to do a good thing, and that's well-intentioned, but there's no there's no certification process, there's, there's no qualifications. If you want to be an accountant, you have to pass some pretty serious exams. If you want to go to Nepal and help with earthquake relief, you don't need to do anything apart from turn up. So I wonder if we can, at some point, talk about creating some sort of qualifications for this kind of thing. That's a, that's a very good point. I just want, uh, go ahead. Okay, just wanted to add something super simple that we realized through our mistakes, um, language the importance of language, um, it makes such a huge difference if you go to a place and you have people who could speak the local language and, and 
and you don't. I, I remember when I first came to Japan after the tsunami, we didn't have a Japanese staff member, and it was so challenging um, and so difficult. And, and I know that now for every disaster we respond, um, not only we're looking for local partners, but in the initial team that we sent from abroad, we're, we're finding um, whether it's Spanish speakers in Ecuador or Arabic speakers in the Syrian refugee crisis. Uh, I just wanted to add that, you know, some of these things could really be anticipated. Like, our issue is children outside of family care, and it doesn't go away. But we don't seem to learn the lesson that if you just counted the kids and kept track of the children where they are in your country, that when a disaster strikes, you would know where to go look. Um, it, you know, it's just one of those simple education or advocacy things that we have to keep pushing at. But it's an obvious thing that we could avoid a lot of trauma and sadness and tragedy if we could get on top of the numbers and then improve our procedures for responding to kids so they're not sleeping in tent cities or out in the open and in dangerous places but they there are you know actions that you can take to get them into safe and protected environments where you before you get them with a permanent family Great. those are overriding systems um, and I think um, opening up for a new question James did you have a question Um, so many of the, the answers and in, in, in the presentations and even this directly is dealt with the idea of learning. And I, it seems to be that disaster response organizations have a very sort of um, rapid cycle of learning, um, either from disaster to disaster or within. And I'm wondering if you guys have formal processes within your organizations as structures to support learning and feedback and those sorts of things, or are you relying sort of on informal more informal process. And let's let Andy start this time. Andy, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got processes in place. I mean, as I think in, in many cases, they can always be improved. I mean, we're, we're still a relatively small organization. And as we've developed and, and grown over the years, we've, we've always tried to, to formalize and, and, and get those systems so that you can, you know, you make sure you can. And, and learning from those m mistakes. But I think it's a, you know, it's a constant learning how to learn is a, is a thing in itself and we're always looking at how to improve that and, and develop that process. Say we build protocols for each of the areas that we work in in our different programs. So in our Sierra Leone protocol that I've helped to write with Terry and our partners on the ground in Sierra Leone, there's a section on Ebola, on, on how we ran it and what to do when that occurs. And so I think, I mean, it's informal that we discuss it, but it's also formal that we have sat down and written it down and tried to figure out you know, how we worked with these situations. So I guess a bit of both. Yeah, I think it, it came um, fairly naturally to our organization just because of the nature of our work that we were um, constantly talking to, to even thousands of people about what they saw and, and that continually kind of reshaped what we were thinking. And so part of it is just the culture of the organization, um, but our our team met um, on on a weekly basis and talked through and on on the survey questions they would sit through and and talk about which ones um, they felt like people are most responsive to and adapt the survey um, and they would um, continually be looking for new partners that might make the process run more effectively um, and. And we also hold community meetings with the um, communities where we're that we're surveying and and share the information that we've gathered back with them and ask them um, what they think, if it makes sense, um, what feedback, and kind of how how the situation has changed since we gather that information. Um, and then we put that into reports and and so it's documented for ourselves and for hopefully many others to use as well. Um, I agree with Andy. I think, I mean, us as an organization, we have so much more to, to improve on that part. But two things that we are doing, um, one is all our country directors in 19 countries where we operate, um, we have different forums, um, whether it's WhatsApp or different forums that we share, um, case studies, success stories, challenges, learning, trying to learn from each other, um, experience. The other thing which is I think more interesting and more important is um, a platform that was also actually 
um, supported by global giving that we started um, in Japan after the tsunami and then we uh, extended to, to Sierra Leone, to the Ebola and now to Nepal and the refugee crisis which is um, a platform that we call Imaging Hope um, which is basically about sharing um, the stories, the life stories of the survivors um, and we basically ask three questions. We ask them, tell us about your life be before the disaster, during and after. And what we found out to be the most interesting thing is that people speak a little bit about their life before, a little bit about what happened during the disaster, but mostly about their life after the disaster. Um, and we have different platforms. We have online, offline, um, community meetings, events to, to share these stories and for survivors from different disasters um, to learn from each other. Great. Um, OK, we have a question from the audience. Hi, um, my name is Akriti Kanal. I'm with the Embassy in Nepal. Um, my question is, I guess, to the folks that have worked um, in Nepal particularly, but I'm sure it can also be translated to other countries, um, is, you know, we've talked about how Nepal has gone, you know, had crisis in the past. It went through a crisis and also had to deal with a crisis after the fact, after the earthquake. Um, there is a huge political transition that's going on, you know, in terms of the new constitution and everything. Um, I know, and I know the government now is in a phase where we're trying to implement the policies of the constitution. So I guess my question to you guys would be, what kind of policies have, you know, has helped you with the work that you've done with other countries that we can learn from? And, you know, this is something that I probably will have to report back to my leadership, but I'd like to hear your input on what kind of stuff has worked in other countries that Nepal can help with in terms of policy uh, when it comes to all these nonprofit organizations that are working in disaster relief. You're holding the mic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, Nepal for me is a second home. I used to live there for three and a half years before the, um, before the earthquake actually. So um, I was, um, in, in the first democratic election in 2008, I was an election observer for the UN, so I kind of saw the, the political shifting. Um, I think for us, in very short, the need for long-term psychosocial support um, to build a local system to advocate for it, to um, have a better academic programs on that. That's something that we're trying to focus on um, with many different partners. There's a lot that's being done already in this field in Nepal. Um, but there's so much more to, to be to to do, and and if we can convey this message to the government, I think that's uh, where a lot of the resources should be going to. Well, just quickly, the one point I would make would be less about specific policies and more about creating a technical space for things to happen in Nepal. Nipper Club is politicized pretty quickly. Um, you know, the new head of the NRA, the National Reconstruction Authority, is an engineer and he's great, but it, his position has become politicized. Um, so how do we create systems and policies that can allow for delivery rather than discussions around personal politics rather than policy and, and governance, which is hard. Yeah. Great. So. Unfortunately, I think those are all the questions we're going to take. Um, we wanted to leave a little time for those in the room to mingle, eat some cookies. Um, thank you so much to the panelists. I'm going to bring Jacqueline back up. Uh, yeah, um, bring Jacqueline back up to, to right. sign us out. Yep. Okay. So I will take her. I'm going to grab the clicker. So you know, thank you so much for our panelists and um, the really incredible, inspiring stories that you have shared today, but also the incredible work that you and your organizations are doing in the face of disasters around the world. Um, and thank you for your time for joining us today. Um, thank you to everyone here at Global Giving who's joining us in person. And thank you to everyone online who has joined us from around the world. I know we didn't get to all of your questions, but we will keep them and find a way to uh, maybe connect you with the organizations if they're specific. Uh, thank you to Britt for moderating today and to the Global Giving staff who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make From the Front Lines happen. Um, you can't see them, they're off screen, but they've been doing a lot of work for this, so thank you so much. And um, also, um, if you, oh, this is going to go through all of this. Boop, 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 boop. You missed a great question. <laughs> yeah, I feel, I'm sad that we weren't able to have Miyako. Um, she was going to talk about their uh, Kumamoto earthquake uh, response efforts, so maybe we'll be able to invite her uh, for the next panel. Um, if you would like to learn more um, about what you heard today or um, sign up for updates about these different programs, 
uh, or even support uh, these different disaster relief efforts, you can go to the event page. The link is behind me and on the screen. Um, and it is also where you registered. Uh, if you scroll to the bottom of that page, we actually list uh, the projects where you can donate, sign up, and do all of that, um, all of these of all of these different organizations. So yeah, thank you so much for everyone, everyone who's here. Uh, feel free to stick around for snacks and drinks and mingle, and thank you everyone online again. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.